Okay, I'm on. All righty then. We're on, guys. <clears throat> Hopefully everything goes smooth. What's happening? All righty. Pray there, brother. As promised, we're going to do the gospel of Abraham and Isaac. 1611, you missed it, man. I just had a nice discussion with a seven-day Adventist. I think it lasted for over an hour. I think you guys missed it. It was over an hour. It was impromptu where we had a nice discussion on whether Jesus is Michael. Luisa, did you hear most of it or if not all of it? Brother, I celebrate it every day. Caras, I celebrate it every day. So I'll celebrate it today. I'll celebrate it tomorrow. I'll celebrate it next week with the Orthodox. But anyway, okay, I hope it was still a blessing because some people dropped out of the discussion. They got bored, I guess. Yeah, he's a very humble young man. He's a Trinitarian. I love you too, Brother Michael. Did you get to listen to it? AD, you are a gorgeous man. I love you, bro. You saw how Satan's trying to discourage me, Lela. Because you understand. If anyone understands, you do how much I love those angels. But Jesus Christ, our Lord, is in control. Lindsay, I didn't get it. Lindsay, I didn't get it. So checked and I didn't get it. Hopefully I will. In Jesus' name, by his grace and mercy. So welcome. I got a shave, man. I, I feel older than I am. But I, hey, come on. Don't hate. I'm still a handsome man. We'll wait a few minutes, open prayer, and we're going to do the gospel, preach to Abraham and Isaac, the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right. You got it, sister. The pre-singing session. Oh, yeah, yeah. Someone asked me if Hefsa's here. She asked me to do Halal Hogan. What's up, brother? Hold on. Hold on. From a different mother. Cristo Anesti. Here you go, bro. You now you in charge, bro. You in charge. Let me add another one. I got some good people here. Let me add them. I'm adding increasing softly but tenderly. Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. I love that song. I gotta remember the words. Once I remember memorize the words, memorize those words, I'll be singing. It's one of my favorite songs. Why do we tarry when Jesus is calling? Come home. Come, come home, children, come home. I love that song. I love that song. Softly, I just don't know the words in Jesus' name. I, I love those songs. Those kind of songs move me in my spirit to glorify Jesus Christ because he's worthy. It's Jesus is calling. Mike A.D., did you like that discussion with the seven-day Adventist? See, we treated him as a brother because he's a Trinitarian. Now, hopefully, further discussions will get him to reconsider. Because some people were saying that they teach a faith works based system of salvation. Does he? Leah, well, yes, he's as good as me? Come on now. Just because he's your dad. Gee, Mike, that makes me feel good. But if it's a David Wood session, you'd be listening, right? That's why I'll never get to 900. Because I got people like my brother here who listen to half of it and leave. Amen, Sally. He's a good man. Yeah, calling old sinner, come home, right? Luisa, you know that song, right? Softly but tender, so, softly and tenderly, Jesus. And I used to go to a Baptist church that was King James only. And I'm going to say this. Some of the most powerful preaching and sermons I've ever heard in my life were from Baptist preacher preachers. I know, Mike, they put us all to sleep, man. Now, you know, Mike, I carry them, right? I've been carrying them, and my back is given out. Pray, because now, God willing, in another week or two, I want to tighten up my training regimen and my eating, because I got to get lose that weight again. Because man, it's I'm, my back is given out. You know, I can't do it anymore. Yeah, I have to say, some of the most powerful sermons I've heard in my life, preaching was from Baptist preachers. I used to love; they used to move me. Move me, they would have me in tears because powerful. They were just powerful men. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. Okay, see on the portals? Oh, see on the portals, he's waiting and calling. 
Oh, waiting and watching. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come. Is that okay? Was that okay? Did I pass? Alex, you can't speak to save your life. <laughs> hey, Lindsay, we should start a Christian duet, Lindsay, where we sing. We go travel and sing for the Lord. <laughs> so, Alex, I just want to ask you something. We're waiting a few more minutes. We had about 180 last time. Okay, perhaps I was waiting for you, but you didn't show up. Alex, I want to share something with you. Here's what I want you to hear. And I want you to be honest, brother, because I care for you, Alex Matos. I just want to know, man, is your face hurting you, bro? Because I, I want to make sure my brother's all right. Is your face hurting you, bro? You feeling pain today? Is your face hurting you? I just want to make sure you're okay. I don't know. Because it's killing me, Alex. How did you fall for that? Even Broken Made Beautiful Ministries knows I was setting you up, player. <laughs> it's killing me, Alex. But it's not hurting you. It's killing me. Please put on that max, mask, Alex. Please. Please, I hope it's mandatory by law that you got to wear a mask, Alex. Please impose that law, please. <laughs> Valiant Crusader, what are you posting, my brother, from a different mother? Mother, is it is it covering most of your face now? All right, all right, yeah, man, it's purgatory. Alex, you've convinced me that we Protestants need to adopt purgatory because when I look at you, I feel like I'm being purged. <laughs> Sorry, bro, I just had to pick on you. Today is Alex Day because I want to live up to my reputation. I'm an equal opportunity offender. I offend everyone, even those I love. So how much more those I hate, right? Thank you, Valiant. Thank you, Valiant Crusader. The Lord Jesus shine his face on you and bless you. I just want you to know it doesn't matter. And I say this. Let me say this. And I'm not being a hero here. I'm not. If I don't see my girls until I die, I'm okay. I'm being honest. I'm just going to share, share this with you. If the Lord is pleased that I don't see my girls on this side of glory, you know, because I sometimes do feel, and I share this with you guys, I sometimes do feel the Lord may be calling me home sooner than later. I don't see myself being old, right? I just, my mind doesn't see it. If God is pleased to keep me here until the Lord comes, amen. If he wants me to be in my 70s, amen. I just don't sense that's going to happen. I just sense that I'm not going to be an old person. Right, I'm 48. I'm going to be 48 September, if the Lord wills. If the Lord wills, but I really don't see myself. And again, I'm not God. Right, I'm not God. God knows when I'm going to die. The Lord knows. I mean, look at our young brother, Nabil Qureshi. Nabil Qureshi, 34 years old. He went to be with the Lord. He's now more alive. Right. He is pain-free, cancer-free, and he'll never want to return to the earth. Once you see Jesus, you don't want to come back, right? And so he went to be with the Lord. And one thing that's like bittersweet, his widow, Lord bless her heart, after several years, God has brought a godly man into her life. I don't know if you've been watching her sessions. She found a godly man, someone who loves the Lord. And, during, and you know, they met and they meet each other at church. And so, but you know what? That almost like pained my heart. Why? You know why I, I pain my heart? Because if you ask her, the ideal situation for her was to grow old with Nabil because they have a daughter together, Aya, right? They have a daughter together. But the Lord had other plans. The Lord was pleased to take Nabil home. And now she has his daughter, and God, in his mercy, is going to give her a godly husband to be a father to her daughter. But, guys, in all honesty, this is just me. Let me just share this with you. This is just me. You can love someone, obviously, 
and she obviously loves this man and she believes he's of the Lord. But it's very hard for me to imagine if you love someone and you've been one with them, husband and wife, and that person was taken while you're still in love with them, you can't stop loving that person. All right? It's not like a divorce if it's bitter or there's a spouse that's cheated or a spouse that abuses you and kills any love you have in your heart. That's easy. That's easy to let go, right? It's easy to let go. If you've been in an abusive marriage and you haven't felt love but abuse, if that person divorces you, leaves you, or dies, you don't feel like you've lost anything. You actually, the only thing you feel is like you wasted your life. Yes, you feel like you lost years on the wrong person, but not so much for that person, right? With Michelle, it was a different story. Michelle was in love with Nabil, and the Lord took him when they were still in love with each other and young. That's a different story. You know what I'm saying? That's a, that's a different dynamic, right? That's different. When you love your partner and the Lord takes them. Alex Matos, Jesus loves you and your wife more than you can imagine. And he's in love with you. As long as you and your wife seek him first and glorify him, he will honor you in his time. Just be patient on the Lord. Learn from me, Alex. Don't rush ahead of God. And if the Lord gives you clear signs, listen to those signs. And by way of confession, I confess. And Al knows. Al, Al right here, he's my brother. He knows me. Even my pre-Christian days, he's come to my Bible study. He can tell you out of his love for me. He may not say it, but he'll tell you. Everyone knew, he knew I wasn't supposed to marry my ex-wife. I wasn't. But I can't regret it because God gave me two beautiful girls from her. So now, please, if you love me for the sake of the Lord, bathe my girls in prayer that God will bring them to me. And God will bless their mother to repent because she too needs Jesus. At the end of the day, it's not about me and her. It's about her and Jesus. But Al will tell you, Al will tell you that God gave me clear signs. Sam, don't marry her. And I justified it and I said, no, Lord, but it's okay, you know, and, you know, she'll be the one and you're going to do a miracle and, and you're going to change it. No, didn't happen, right? So what am I saying to Alex? If God has brought your wife to you, enjoy her now. Alex, if this is the woman that God brought into your life, the kids will come in God's timing if he's pleased. What you want to do is become best friends. As you fall in love with Jesus, fall in love with each other. You know the marriages that work? Can I tell you what the marriages that work? Let me tell you the keys to successful marriage. Number one, both parties are in love with Jesus more than anything. Thank you, brother, broken man. God bless you. Both parties are in love with Jesus more, with, more than anything. you got to love Jesus more than anything. And number two, Become best friends. Become best friends. When you two become best friends, then the marriage becomes inseparable, right? Learn to become best friends. So take this, Alex. Take this time in which the Lord hasn't given you a child yet, and we'll pray in Jesus' name. He gives you one. That God is allowing you guys to grow attached to each other, to mesh into each other, become inseparable. And that becomes the most sweetest, beautiful marriages that you can experience. Amen, Alex. Praise God. That's the key. Be in love with Jesus more than you love anything and then become best of friends. You know, most marriages, the, the spouses can't stand each other. They cannot stand each other. So they're only in it for the sake of the kids. And that doesn't last after a while. And I'll be honest. I will be honest. I only stuck around for my kids. Within the first year of marriage, I knew I had made a mistake, but I was committed. I said, it's all right. I'm going to, you know, fight this through. And I did it imperfectly. I too failed. I too acted in the flesh. I'm not an angel. But if you had asked me, believe it or not, one of the healthiest things, one of the healthiest things that happened to me is I got out of this relationship. It was healthy for me. But where my heart breaks my daughters, I pray it will not cause irreparable damage and that they will fall in love with Jesus and that I can be there sooner than later to be Jesus to them before the damage is done. That's my prayer. But at the end of the day, here's what I want to leave you with. And we're going to begin in prayer. We're going to begin in prayer. And I'm not saying this because I'm a hero. I'm not. I am not. 
I am not a hero. I am a sinner. But I can honestly say, I can say this, and I believe it's from my heart, and I pray Holy Spirit will make it from my heart. My life, folks, and I'm not saying this to be a hero. I'm not. My life, my life is not my children. My life is for Jesus. So I've already put in my heart. I've already resolved in my heart. Lord, it may be I never see my daughters again on this side of glory. I'm okay with it. As long as you love them, as long as you're in love with them, as long as you protect them, they are in the best hands possible. One thing I ask of you, my Lord, and I mean this. This is my prayer. The work you began in me, complete it. Let me honor you. Let me glorify you. Let me praise you. Let me love you. Let me never shame you. And even in death, let me bring you glory because I exist for you and I want to finish the race for your glory. My life is Jesus. I can't live without him. I can live without my girls. I can live without my girls. I can't live without Jesus. I can't. I'm being honest. And I'm being a hero. Oh, Sam, you're super, super. I'm not. I'm not. I'm a sinner. I got issues. I struggle with sinful passion. I get lonely. Like everyone, I am a sinner. I honor. But I can tell you, I can't imagine life without Jesus. I can't. And then honestly, before the Lord, if they told me, you can have your girls, but stop glorifying Jesus. You can have your girls, but don't speak about Jesus. I'll say, you can keep my girls. Because Jesus was in love with me before I had my daughters. Jesus walked with me before I had my daughters. Jesus watched me and protected me before I had my daughters. Jesus was there for me from the beginning, not my daughters. Right? You want me there? Can you say Stewie to his mother so his mother can answer the question whether he has 10 toes or not? He wants to know if a dog like him has 10 toes. Exactly, Mike. So I just say that, and I mean that. Folks, remember, your children are a gift from the Lord, but they are God's creation. If the Lord wants to take them, or if the Lord wants to keep them in your life, he is the Lord. They are his gifts to you. They were not created for you. They were created for his glory. So if he wants to use you to raise them in the fear of the Lord, amen. If he wants to take them, his will be done. But you cannot make your children an idol. And I'm going to share this. I want to share this by way of confession. It got to the point, and Al is a witness, by the way. If I'm lying, he's here. Al, you're a witness, right? And you love the Lord, and you'll put me in my place if I'm lying. My girls, because I became so attached to them and so in love with them, they did end up becoming an idol because I allowed myself to be disgraced, humiliated, belittled, insulted, and abused. As long as I was in the house with them, I didn't care. And I was dying. I, I went up to 340 pounds. I was dying. I was dying. Al, am I lying, brother? You are my neighbor. Am I lying to you, brother? He's a man. He, he knows it. And I don't mean to bring you in, brother. I apologize. But I don't want them to think I'm just pity party and I'm lying. Right? See? Al D, sad but true. He's a witness. I used to do ministry in Michigan. And I used to call in the morning to make sure she was up because my ex-wife had a sleeping problem. She couldn't sleep till 4 or 5 in the morning. And my kids were young, and she wouldn't get up till 1, 2 in the afternoon. Al, you're a witness of I'm lying. I would call, and she wouldn't pick up. And I'd have to call him or his wife to go to my house to see if my girls were okay. He's a witness. This man here is a witness of I'm lying. And then she would abuse me and cuss me out saying, why are you getting people involved? Why are you calling people? Yeah, that was my life. See, Al? You see? Yep. You guys read it right here. I'm not lying. So you know what God did, folks? Can I tell you what God did? Can I tell you what the Lord did for me? Enough is enough. This woman will abuse you no more, and you're not going to make your daughters an excuse and an idol. I will remove you whether you like it or not, and I'm going to fight this battle. Enough is enough. That's what the Lord did. Enough is enough. That's what the Lord did for me. The Lord is listening if I'm lying. The Lord knew I wasn't leaving. 
I would have stayed there until she drove me into a grave, into, into a tomb. Because I love my girl so much. I go, it's okay. In fact, folks, can I can I open, be a little open with you? And people are going to hear this, and I'm not lying. When I caught her with the affair, because I had hired a private investigator, I was so desperate. You know what I did? I made her a deal. I said, look, I know you're seeing someone, because this was a second affair. Go live with him. Leave me in the house. You can keep your clothes here, because uh, you're leaving anyway. She would leave at 730 and wouldn't come home till four or five in the morning. And sometimes she didn't even show up. Go live with the guy. Leave me in the house with my daughters. You can be with him. And we'll, we, we won't let him know that we're not together. That's how desperate I got. And that's the level I sung to. That's how desperate I got. And that's the level I sung to. The Lord is listening if I'm lying to you. Just so another man wouldn't enter into the home without me be there. With my girls in the house. And the Lord said, no, you're leaving. And so I learned. And you know what I learned? I do not live for my daughters. I live for you, my God. And if it means I don't see them again, your will be done. Because my daughters cannot be an idol between you and me. I cannot allow them to be an idol. And I can't love them more than you. You are my God, not them. So I let them go. I let them go. And if you want to see how real the battle is, the spiritual battle, and I hope you guys don't mind that I open up my hearts to you, my family, because I want to be more than a teacher. I want to be your brother. And I want to be as honest as I can without making myself the victim or pity party. God forbid. I'm a sinner. I failed. Okay. Do you want to see how real the satanic battle is? Because God is real. Satan is real. And Satan wants to destroy those in the front lines. So through this marriage, he thought he was going to get rid of me and kill me and make me lose my testimony. And God intervened. And I'm not the only one. Go look at the life of my other brothers. Look at David Wood and what he's gone through. Mother Odin. Brother Odin, but survived. Two son sons with special needs, right? Every one of us in the front lines were suffering something. Anthony Rogers is suffering something. We all are. Because Satan wants to take those warriors. And I'm not saying I'm a warrior. Take him out because God has empowered them to destroy his kingdom and he hates us. Last night, and you'll hear it on my live stream. Last night, God blessed us. We had about 250 people show up. Praise the Lord. I pray you increase this for your glory. Last night, as I'm answering a question, an Assyrian guy I don't talk to. I haven't spoken to him in over a year because he's not a friend of mine. Right? Two failed marriages, divorces. He plays the victim because he's a narcissist. Sends me a picture, folks, last night in the midst of it. And what is it, a picture? It's a picture that he got from, I think, social media. My ex-wife with her boyfriend, my two daughters and a son, they're taking a family picture with her boyfriend, his arm tattooed around my oldest daughter, and they're smiling, and he sends that to me. In the midst of me preaching last night. And you know what's heartbreaking about the picture? You know what's heartbreaking? My oldest daughter was wearing glasses. I did not know that she, she's wearing glasses. When I saw her with glasses, it broke my heart. Because here I am. I'm not in their lives to know what they're going through. I had to see through a picture that my oldest daughter is wearing glasses. And you know, tell me it's a coincidence. Last night... Resurrection weekend, as I'm preaching my heart out, and today I'm going to preach. But today, being with you, you know what that's a sign of? You know what that's a sign of? You know what's that a sign of? He that is in us is greater than he was in the world. Satan can do whatever he wants to me. As long as you and I are covered by the blood of Jesus, washed in the blood of Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, enslaved to the Holy Spirit, he will lose and he will lose over and over and over again. He will not destroy us. And he will not destroy me because I am the blood-bought property of Jesus. And you know what I said when I saw that picture? I said, Lord, I'm done with them. I hand them to you. They're not my daughters anymore for now. This is your battle. They're your children, your fight. I have to focus on you. And I'm not trying to be a hero. So what we say to, to Satan in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus shielding us against you and the fire of the Holy Spirit surrounding us against you, not today, Satan, and not any day, you will not win over us because we are 
drenched in the blood of Jesus. And the blood of Jesus, damn you to the pit of hell. In Jesus' name. Okay? Amen? Not today, Satan. And not any day. Not any day will you have victory over me. Not even over against David Wood. Because he's covered by the blood of Jesus. And he has victory in Christ. Hallelujah! Dave, as much as you're a hater and a dictator and the great white hope, dope, I mean, dict I love you and I'll carry you till I die. You're the only guy I won't give up. I'll give up on everyone but you, David. I will keep carrying you until you get 200 million viewers and 2,000 people watching your show and making 20,000 a month as I panhandle carrying you. I will not give up on you, sir. In Jesus' name. Thank you. So we love you, Father. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Put us on fire. Anoint me to recall passages. Interpret them correctly. Bless us to understand your word. Fall in love with you and make us more holy and pure, more in love with you. And bless my daughters and flood them in the blood of Jesus. Save them from that man. Convict their mother and bless our families. We love you, Father. Lord Jesus, we adore you. Increase in us. Holy Spirit, take over and bring them to hear your words for the glory of Jesus in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We ready? Okay, when do you want me to call you? Today, can I call you tomorrow or do I have to call you today? Can I call you tomorrow or do I have to call you today? Because I was going to go do some exercise so I can get in shape like you afterwards. Okay, I'll call you tonight. Yes, sir. See, by the way, folks, David Wood, because he's the general, he's like the general patent of Christianity. When he gives an order and you're part of his team, you better listen or out you go. Yes, sir. Or should I say, yes, boss? Yes, boss. Boss, I always try to do my best. All right. Yes, sir. Aye, aye, Captain. This soldier is not going to go AWOL, Captain. I'll call you later. All right. Are we ready? I'm going to have to call him. Okay, with that said. Everyone ready in the saddle so we can begin? By the way, that line, yes, boss. Yes, boss. But, boss, I always do my best. Do you know where I got that line from as we're about to begin the gospel? This was all prepare you guys because we're waiting for the regulars. Do you know where I got that from? I got it from the movie Way of the Dragon, a.k.a. Return of the Dragon. Bruce Lee's third martial arts flick where he beats up white boy Chucky. Hey, Chucky, you little fake karate tag tournament player. Bruce whipped you, baby. Here's a Chuck Norris fact. Bruce whipped your behind, sucker. So in that movie, you had that effeminate Chinese character that was playing for the white boss. Notice a white boss again, and the Chinese was subservient. Yes, boss. Yes, boss. But boss, I always do my best. Ah, they're helped by a man named Tang Long. Tang Long. Ah, but this man knows Chinese Gong Fu. Gong Fu. <laughs> That's a scene, right? As you can see, I'm a big Bruce Lee freak. I love him. Yes, boss. Yes, boss. Movement number four. Dragon seeks path. Dragon whips his tail. Have you, have you noticed the dubbing, by the way? There was a guy who did it phenomenally. I can't do it. And I'm going to do halal for you, Sister Epstein. Don't worry. A guy who does a phenomenal impersonation of the dubbed kung fu movies. Like this here. Hey! How you doing today? You know what? I really love you. Yes, I said I love you. See, that's the one. Remember that? I remember one kung fu film that we're going to begin. One silly kung fu film where the guy stabbed and he's dying. Ah, oh, and the guy comes, brother, brother, I'll avenge your death. And the guy said, but I'm not done yet. Do you remember that? It was actually a Kung Fu movie. I'm not lying. The guy got stabbed, I think, with a sword, and he's like, ah. And the guy comes up and goes, brother, brother, I'll avenge your death. And the guy says, I'm not done yet. All right, yep. Let's begin. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Preach Abraham and Isaac. 
foreshadows of Christ in the Old Testament. How? The Old Testament points to Jesus. Is Louisa here? Everyone here? Are you ready now to begin Resurrection Sunday? Glory to God. You see how Satan tried to attack me last night? And glory to Jesus. He that is in us is almighty and greater than Satan, who's a creature under the feet of Jesus, whom Jesus, his God and judge, will damn to hell. Because he thought he's going to stop me. No. As long as Jesus loves me and covers me by his blood, he's not stopping me. There's no stopping us. Nothing in creation, not even Satan, will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I'm going to show you how Abraham and Isaac are a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I have articles on this, and I've done sessions already on this topic. But because it's Resurrection Weekend, we're going to, again, revisit this issue because we're creatures repetition. The more we hear something over and over again, <clears throat> the better we are able to recall it and become second nature by the power of the Holy Spirit to use it for the glory of Christ. So that's what we're going to do now. And Hapsa, let me do Halal Hogan now, and I'll do it later for you. Okay, brother. Listen, admins. We need to get ready, brother. So I want you to turn to Genesis 22, brother. What you going to do when we preach the gospel to you, brother? <sighs> All right. Ooh, that takes a lot. Do I actually sound like him, honestly? Because I'm losing my voice. My voice is not as healthy as it used to be. When I was younger, I used to sound exactly like him. When I was in my late teens, early 20s, exactly. But my voice is not the same. Do I sound like him? All right. All right. Genesis 22, let's unpack it. How does Genesis 22 point to the gospel of Jesus Christ? I gave you the series of links to the articles yesterday. It's in the description box of yesterday's session, not the late night one, the earlier one. So let's go. Genesis 22, verses 1 to 2. Okay. Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 to 2. I already did, Sophia. You, you probably didn't hear when I invoked the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to bless us and anoint us in the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus. Okay. Genesis 22, verses 1 to 2. Invite more people, man. I want to see about 250 like last night to hear this. This is powerful. Good stuff. Okay. And it came to pass after these things <clears throat> that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Okay. And he said, Take not now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now, if you have your Bible open, or you have a software where you underline or highlight, Underline your son, your only son whom you love, right? Your son, your only son whom you love, and burnt offering, okay? Now let's unpack that. You guys, are you sure you want me to go in depth and go into some meat, or do you want me to keep it shallow and surface? Who wants meat? Because if I go meat, it's going to be a little lengthy. You positive? Okay. Number one. The word son, your only son, the one whom you love, the word yachid, I'll get into that. But here's what I want you to think about. Here, let's go into Wagu steak, like my friend says. Phantom, he says Wagu. All right. Folks, Isaac was never the only son of Abraham. Isaac was the second son born to Abraham. For at least 14 years, Ishmael was his only son. So when God says to Abraham, your only son, Isaac, Ishmael was already born. And he was 14 years old when Isaac was born. So why would God say about Isaac, you, Isaac, are Abraham's only son. Abraham, this is your only son. God bless you, Hafsa. I am honored to be used of Jesus to bless your Easter. Your first Easter. Notice what she just said? Her first Easter, she left Islam and became a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. What an honor for me to serve you and bless you on this first Easter. Okay, Daryl, you got it. Mickey, you got it. Mickey and Daryl got it. Because though Ishmael is Abraham's son, Ishmael is not the promised son. God promised Abraham a son from Sarah, and that son would be the heir of the covenant promises. So what God is saying, the only son that I promised to you to be the heir of the promises given to you. You got it. Is it making sense now? In other words, he's the only son in this sense. 
He's unique. Not the one that's the only born son, but he's the only born son whom God promised to give to Abraham to be the heir of the covenant. You with me there? So now when they tell you, how can Isaac be the only son? Ishmael's there because you misunderstand. Ishmael came not as the result of God's promise, but as the result of Abraham and Sarah's impatience and lack of trust. Now, when you get a chance, I want you to read Genesis 16 on your own. Genesis 16 on your own. Ishmael was born because Sarai was frustrated. She was frustrated. Abraham was around 75 years old. She was frustrated because she's barren, and she felt she felt as a failure as a wife. Follow with me. Because she couldn't give an heir to her husband. So it was a cultural practice, by the way. And by the way, glory to God. Glory to God. Archaeological discoveries, discoveries that they made in the 20th century have helped us understand the, the background of the Bible with greater depth and clarity because they discovered tablets from Ugarit and, and Ibla, tablets written around the time of Abraham that tell us how the peoples thought and some of the laws that were common at that time. It was a common practice at that time, a common practice at the time, that a woman could give her maidservant to her husband so that she could sire a child for him, almost like a surrogate mother. Are you with me there? That's why Sarah told Abraham, here's my maidservant, Hagar, go into her and have a child. But Hagar was doing it for Sarah, procuring an offspring for Abraham, her husband. So Hagar wasn't the wife. She was Sarah's surrogate. Here you go. Sleep with Abraham. Give him a child as an heir on my behalf. Okay. But it backfired against her because the text shows that Hagar started resenting Sarah and get, got a little proud and arrogant because she had a son and looked down on her mistress because her mistress is incapable of siring a child for Abraham. And so she started looking down on Sarai saying, now, in, one, in a way, I'm better than you. And now I'm attached to Abraham because I gave him a son. And that's when she started persecuting Hagar and ran her off. This is now Genesis 16. Everything I'm giving you is Genesis 16. You with me there? Genesis 16 verses 1 to 6. What does that tell you, folks? Are you ready to go into meat? Because you're expecting or you're trusting and praying, the Holy Spirit fill me with meat to fill you with meat, right? You don't want surface. This again shows you that even the best of saints, even the heroes of the Bible can be the worst of sinners. Notice how dysfunctional Abraham's family was. Abraham and Sarai, instead of waiting on the Lord, took matters into their own hands because Sarai grew impatient and started losing trust and hope that God would give her a son and gave Abraham her concubine or her mistress so he can sleep with her. And instead of Abraham saying, watch this, instead of Abraham saying, no, no, you're my wife. God has promised that I will receive a son from you. He promised me that in Genesis 15. I'm going to wait on the Lord, and you're going to wait on the Lord until God gives you a son. What did Abraham do? He went ahead and listened to Sarai, and he faltered, and he got another woman pregnant with Ishmael. Now, instead of then being a godly example to Hagar, because remember, Hagar is the Egyptian. Sarai and Abraham know the true God. Hagar, steeped in paganism, came out of a pagan culture because she's from Egypt. That's where they got her from, okay? Genesis 12. And being a godly example and loving on her with the love of Christ, she drove her away out of envy and bitterness. So what do you learn here? Even the best of women of faith can also be the most selfish and self-centered. Why? Because even women of faith are creatures of emotions, and at times, they let their emotions get the better of them, and when they do, they mess things up for them and their families. And it's ironic I'm saying this. I didn't mean to go this direction. Uh, folks, believe me when I tell you, I don't plan how I'm going to preach. I don't. I have an idea, and I trust the Holy Spirit, and I seek the Holy Spirit to guide me. It's ironic I'm telling you this, 
that Sarai, the woman of the covenant, because of her emotions, she let her emotions get the better of her, of her, uh, of her common sense and trust in the Lord. So she went by her emotions, not by what God had told her and her trust in God. And because of that, she messed things up because Ishmael came into the world as a thorn in the side of Israel. And the reason why I say it's ironic, because it just hit me, honestly. And I'm not trying to talk about her. It just hit me. That's what happened with my ex-wife. My ex-wife, because we were pretty much roommates, because I couldn't handle the abuse, so I just shut her out, and she couldn't handle the neglect. When she was in the gym, someone preyed on her emotions and then sw sweet-talked her. And she let her emotions get the better of her, even though she knew this is sin. This is adultery. I can't do this. I'll sin against God and I'll destroy my marriage. But her emotions got the best of her. And now look at where we're at. Let it be a lesson to you women. Let me, and I'm trusting the spirit to guide me. Please, spirit. You're the teacher. I'm your mouthpiece. Use us for the glory of Christ. Women, let this be a lesson to you. Do not let your emotions get the better of you. Do not make decisions based on your emotions, your emotional needs. Because I promise you, you will regret your actions that are done because your emotions got the better of you. You will regret it for the rest of your life, as Sarai and Abraham did. Are you with me there? Trust me when I say this, women. You are creatures of emotions. Men are too, but men tend to let their carnal passions and their eyes guide them. In other words, men are driven by what they see, a beautiful, gorgeous woman, and their carnal, lustful desires more so than their emotions, whereas women, they are... They are Guided by their emotions more so than their sight and their carnal desires. Isn't that true? Women tell me I'm wrong. Men tell me I'm wrong. We, If you want to get to a man's heart, look pretty. Look pretty and you got him. You know? You sisters who are single and want to get married, deck yourselves up in a Christ-honoring way. In a Christ-honoring. I'm not saying be half naked. That dishonors the Lord. Boy, will you got guys line up. What's up, sister? Can I pray with you? Yeah. Come on. Let's have a Bible study. Woo! Right? Am I lying here? Whereas men, do you want a sister to fall in love with you? Do you want a sister to fall in love with you? Keep sweet-talking them. And the women are going to tell me here if I'm lying. They may say no. But women, come on. Be honest with the brothers here. You know what happens when, so when someone says no and he keeps going after it and he keeps sweet talking you. It's only a matter of time where you melt because he's now getting to you emotionally. Am I right? Okay. Women, I'm not talking about Jeremy. You're not a woman. At least from your name, I can't tell. Okay, well, uh, Anna, you know why, Anna? You're a special breed of woman. You're the type that have subjected your emotions to Christ. But ignore yourself, Anna. Put yourself aside. You are asking the Spirit to give you power over your emotions. But Anna, look around. Look at the women around you. Is this not true of the other women who have not sought the Spirit to subject their emotions to the Spirit and let the Spirit guide them, not their emotions? Say it again, Anna. Say it. One more time so they can hear it. Ah, can I get a witness? No, no, it's Anna. It's 100% true for those women who are not spiritually mature. And then even women who are spiritually mature. That doesn't mean they're not spiritually mature. See, she's trying to be, eh, it's 80%. See, that's an emotional reaction, Anna. Your emotions are getting the better of you. Because, no, okay, it's only 80%. There. Uh -huh. <laughs> See, even that was a sign of your emotions getting the best of you, Anna. Okay, so what's my point? What's my point? Okay, here's my point. Learn from the example of the Bible's characters and heroes. Sarai let her emotions get the better of her. Sarai let her feelings of inadequacy 
and not living up to her husband's expectations. So she thought, make her do something that she lived to regret. Here, take my miss, my, uh, my servant, my maid servant, mistress. Go ahead, have a child with her. Now, Abraham, as a man of faith, you know what he was supposed to say, folks? Do you know what he's supposed to say? He was supposed to say, no, no, you are the one. God has promised me seed from you. You are my wife. You are my friend. You are my partner. God said, I'm going to have an heir, not from the maidservant, but from you. So we're going to wait on God. We're going to trust God. We're going to pray. And in his timing, it will happen. Alex, are you listening? Alex Matos. And I'm not saying you got a maidservant, right, as a surrogate. But you get it now? Abraham's story, Sarai's story, is an example of what not, what not to do. Women, do not let your emotions govern your actions. You're going to regret it for the rest of your life. And I'm an example of that. My daughters will now be damaged because they, her, their mother allowed her emotions to get the best of her. She even admits, I can't be alone. I need a man in my life. Well, the only man that you need is Jesus. He's the God man. He won't abuse you and use you and dump you. But until she comes to that realization, there's nothing anyone can do for her. Right? None can, anyone can do for her. And men, as partners to your spouse, you're supposed to encourage them. No, it's okay, sweetheart. No, no, no. Don't think like that. That's not true. The Lord is with us. He loves you and loves me. We're going to trust on the Lord. We're going to keep trusting the Lord. He loves us more than we can imagine. He's never failed us. Let's not fail him. But that's where Abraham dropped the ball, right? So because of that one decision, Ishmael came. And then God says to, to Abraham, because he's your physical seed, I will bless him because I love Ishmael. He's my creation. I love him, right? I'm the one who caused Hagar to have a son when you got her pregnant. I determined the gender, right? And therefore, I'll bless him because he's your son. But no, he's not the promised child. Let's go to Genesis 17, 15 to 16. Right? I wasn't planning going this direction, but the, the, there's a lot of meat to unpack. Practical stuff. Practical stuff. And God said unto Abraham, as for Sarai, thy wife, Thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. Why? And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she will be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. This woman who's barren, I will bring nations from her, from her womb. Nations will come out of her. But she's barren, God. She's 89 years old. I'm 99. What are you talking about? Genesis 17, verses 17, 18. Genesis 17, verses 17, 18. Watch here. Watch what happens. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is 100 years old? Man, I'm about to be 100. And shall Sarah that is 90 years old bear? He laughed. Are you kidding me? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. You, you didn't get it. Do you see what he just said? Watch this. No, she didn't laugh, Sophia, here. That's Genesis 18. Abraham laughed. Abraham laughed. Pedro, let me show you how deep the scriptures are, how honest the scriptures are, how real they are. Abraham is laughing at the idea that he, at 100, can have a son from his wife who's 90. In other words, he still did not comprehend the power of his God. He doubted God's ability to cause his wife to have a child at the age of 90 from a 100-year-old man. So he laughed. Seriously? Come on, man. <laughs> you get it? You just read it, Karas. Are you reading it, Karas? Allah Akbar. Read, Karas. Genesis 17, 17, 18. What does that tell you, folks? That even the prophets, the patriarchs, Learn about God's character the more they walked with him. 
Okay, let me repeat this again. There's two. I'm gonna have to do a part two, I think, because there's a lot of meat, guys. A lot of meat. Yeah, guys, come on. It's only 82 people. No one likes me. A lot of meat. Okay, follow with me here. A lot of meat here. The Bible is clear that none of these men of God who spoke with God had perfect theology. Their theology, meaning their understanding of God, was perfected and corrected over time. For example, if Abraham truly understood, Abraham truly understood God is all-powerful, why would he laugh and be skeptical about God's ability of giving him a son at the age of 100 to a barren woman who's 90 years old? It's number one. Yep, exactly. Abraham went to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah. Secondly, secondly, you find this in other stories. For example, when God says to Cain, when God says to Cain, where is your brother? And, and Cain says, how should I know? Am I my brother's keeper? Doesn't that tell you that Cain did not know God's nature adequately enough to realize that God sees all things so that he assumed he could cover up and lie to God about the murder of his brother? That's another example, right? So are you seeing that in these books, you're seeing real men with real limitations, with real sins, with imperfect theology, theology that's being perfected the more they walk with God and grow in their understanding of God. In other words, none of them come out knowing God truly, completely, and perfectly. Right? Or let's go with Adam and Eve. Let's go with Adam and Eve. When they heard God's walking in the garden, they hid. Why would they hide if they knew God is omnipresent, omniscient? Meaning they knew that God sees all things and is aware of all things because they didn't know that. They're, they learned that. They're learning that. Are you with me there? Are you seeing that example? Okay. Let me give you another example. Jonah. Jonah chapter 1. Well, it's not simply showing up in person. Remember, they're new, newborn babes, meaning they've been created from scratch, fresh. They're babes in adult bodies. They just are getting to know their God. He didn't create them to be all-knowing, meaning to know God inside and out, but to grow in their knowledge of God as they grow in their relationship with him. King James 1611, 1611 King James. God has designed it. That we grow in our knowledge of God as we grow in our relationship with him. The more we walk with him, the more we talk with him, the more we love him, the more we know his character and what he's truly like. That's how God has designed it. God bless you, Lisa. Right? Is it making sense how God has designed it? He could have created you knowing his nature inside and out. No, he wants you to grow in that relationship. Grow in your love with him the more you walk with him. So his reward to you is walk with me. And the more you walk with me, the more you're going to get to know me, the more you're going to see what I'm like, and the more you're going to fall in love with the God that you walk with. But it's a relationship. Take this journey with me. Walk with me. I want to take a journey with you. A journey that's forever everlasting where we will be walking together in the garden, talking together, laughing with each other forever and ever. And the more you get to know me, the more you're going to fall in love with me because the more you're going to see that my nature is irresistible. And that's marriage. That's marriage. The more you walk with your husband, the more you walk with your wife, the more you talk and and enjoy and laugh and struggle, the more you fall in love with each other and the more inseparable you become. That's exactly a reflection of your relationship with God. You see how it's working? You see how it's working? See? So because they're growing in their understanding of God, they're starting to figure out, in Jesus' name, Father, Son, Jesus. Blood of Jesus Christ, rebuke the rebuke, uh, the buffering. Ya alem shika. Please, Lord. Please, Lord. In Jesus' name. Because they're growing in their understanding of God, 
they're starting to figure out this God knows everything. This God is present everywhere. We may not see him visibly, but he sees us and we're before him. Uh, Muhammad, do you want to call me now so I can school, school you? I don't mind. You guys mind if I school him? Hold on, or maybe they're going to ask you to wait because I want to school you and your prophet. You guys want me to school this guy or do you want me to continue? School him? One for schooling him. Okay. You're okay. So don't forget the point now. Don't forget the point. These are examples showing you they're learning about God, right? You got that point? They're learning about God, right? Okay, good. Don't forget that. Okay, Muhammad, call me because we're going to have fun with your prophet. Give him my number. And you better answer questions directly. Can I prophesy it won't last more than 10 minutes? You will learn a loose a loose BC because it's not going to last more than 10 minutes, I promise you. Give him give him my number, Protestant. You're not there? What happened? First last, you guys are gone? My goodness. Bunch of lazy bums, and I pay them for nothing, which I don't pay them anyway. Bums. You dirty bums. Call me, dude. Let's have a fun at your expense. Okay. Another example of someone who didn't realize the nature of God completely. You know who? You know who's another example, guys? Jonah. In the book of Jonah, chapter 1, when God says to Jonah, go to the great city Nineveh, the capital of my ancestors, the Assyrians, it says he jumped on a ship to flee to Tarshish, and he tried to run from the presence of Jehovah. Now, if Jonah truly understood that God is omnipresent, wasn't that the stupidest thing he could have done? Right? What more stupid thing you could have done than to think you can flee the presence of God. Because in his mind, he thought God's presence is confined to the temple in Jerusalem. It's confined to Jerusalem, right? So if I leave Jerusalem, then God can't make me go to the Nineveh, the Ninevites. And then God showed him, no, 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 no. Just because my presence is in Jerusalem in a unique manner, the entire creation is present before me, and I oversee all things and sustain all things. Wherever you go, I'm already there. So Jonah learned the hard way, didn't he? Jonah learned the hard way, didn't he? You catch it? And what's ironic, he already had the Psalms of David, Psalm 139, to read from, which told him, wherever you go, God's presence is there. Wherever you go, God's spirit is there. But that tells you that even though he had the scriptures, he still did not understand the scriptures perfectly. You see how it works? You see how it works? Making sense to everyone? So let's focus until he calls. So what, what do we learn in Genesis 17? Abraham is incredulous that God is able to give him a son because he still does not understand the power of God. Why do you think God says to Moses, I revealed myself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, El Shaddai. Go to Genesis 17, verse 1. Let me bring out the key to this. Genesis 17, verse 1. Now everything's going to make sense. Like, wow, Holy Spirit, thank you for this illumination. Genesis 17, verse 1. How does God appear to him and by what name? How does God appear to him by what name? Genesis 17, verse 1. Watch. And when Abraham was 99 years old and 9, 90 years old and 9, 99, the Lord Jehovah appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. You see what he said? I'm Almighty God. Why do you think he started off by saying, this is my name, El Shaddai, Almighty God? Because I'm going to do the impossible. I'm going to do the impossible. Your wife, who's going to be 90, barren, and you at 100, you're going to get her pregnant. She's going to conceive and have a son. Something humanly impossible. And you know why I can do what is humanly impossible? Because I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. So he revealed the name and then he showed him the power of the name. This is my name and here's the proof that I live up to this name. I'm almighty and I'm going to do a miracle proving to you I'm almighty. And what's the miracle? A woman at 90 who's never gotten pregnant before because she's barren gets pregnant by a 100-year-old male body and gives birth to a son. Do you want more proof I'm almighty God? Focus, Stephen. If he doesn't call, don't worry about it. You focus. Focus for the glory of Christ. 
right? El Shaddai, right? Now let's see Sarai's reaction. Genesis 18, 10 to 15. Genesis 18, 10 to 15. Genesis 18, 10 to 15. Watch. Genesis 18, 10 to 15. Focus. I want you guys to grow. A lot of meat. I didn't expect this was gonna, I would go this in depth. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of, li of life. Pay attention. Now, I need you really pay attention. Guys, please pay attention. Watch what Sarah, Sarah does. She's now Sarah. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. She's in the tent. They're outside, so she's hiding in the tent. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old and stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of woman. She was too old and barren to begin with. Now, notice her response. Therefore, Sarah laughed like Abraham did. Sarah laughed within herself. It wasn't even something she did verbally. She, like, she kept it to herself, so God wouldn't hear. <laughs> Hiding, right? Within herself, saying, after I am wax old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? Now, notice God's response. And the Lord Jehovah said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child, which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for Jehovah? Didn't I tell you I am El Shaddai, God Almighty? And the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Now notice what she says. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. Oh boy, we got meat here. Do you understand the meat here? Do you guys understand the meat? Notice she thought she could keep her laughter hidden from God. It says she's in the tent because they're outside talking. And she thought if she said this, God wouldn't know. And God said, why is she laughing? God even told Abraham what she said in herself. Oops. And then she tried to deny it. I didn't say it. Yes, you did. Now, folks, can I ask you a question? If Sarah truly grasped, follow with me here. If Sarah truly grasped and understood, Jehovah is all-knowing. He's omniscient. He knows what you're going to say before you say it, and he knows what you're thinking in your hearts and can see what you're doing, even though physically he's not there. Do you think she would have reacted this way? Do you think she would have reacted this way? So what are you learning here? What are you learning here? You're learning that even these great men and women of God did not know God perfectly and completely, and their theology had to be perfected and corrected, and they too grew in their understanding of who God is, just like you and me. You understand what you just learned here? You're learning that they too are having their theology corrected, perfected, and they're growing to understand the person and nature of God. So that should give you hope. If these men and women of God, some of whom were inspired and taught directly by the Holy Spirit in a miraculous manner, to preach and write down the words of God and preserve them perfectly, and they saw God visibly, either in time and space or dreams and visions, and witnessed miracles, if they too could be mistaken about God and need their theology corrected and perfected, then there's hope for the rest of us. There's hope for the rest of us, right? But what's the key point? What's the key point? Walk with me as Abraham walked with me. Let's embark on this journey together because like Abraham, you'll be my friend and you're going to get to know me a little better with each passing day. With each passing day, be my friend and walk with me and you're going to know me more and fall in love with me more. Because the more you get to know me, you won't be able and can't help yourself from loving me more and more. Because I am altogether lovely. I am altogether lovely. And you know what? I can say to you. Jesus has been with me since a young age. I mean, he's been with me since conception. He's been with all of us. But let me tell you a little bit of my story. Can I interject my story into this as well? A little bit of my story into this and tie it in because the Bible 
is to be read so we can know how to live and know how to trust God. It's written for our instruction. Okay. The first time I was introduced to who Jesus was, I was about six and a half years old. I was about six and a half years old. A young Lebanese Assyrian boy named Raymond Malko. Raymond Malko. And he watches my YouTube channel. He's still around. He's married with three kids. God bless him. Came up to me. He was nine years old. His grandmother, a saintly woman who taught him the gospel. His mother died when he was a toddler. And he was raised by his maternal grandmother, his mother's mother. His father pretty much had abandoned him, stayed in Lebanon. They came to Chicago, him and his older brother. He comes up to me and he tells me the story. Guys, he's nine. I'm six and a half. He tells me the story about Jesus Christ. Though I was born in a Christian home, my parents never told me, never told me. Now, Abraham Ishaq, I know you are a wicked, filthy dog like Muhammad and probably worse than Muhammad. I did a show with David Wood destroying your filthy, wicked blasphemy because you want to justify your perverted Muhammad sleeping and defiling a nine-year-old because he was a bastard of Satan like you are. Get out of here. Get this dog out of here. Send him to the Black Stone because he wants Isaac to be like Muhammad, a pedophile, woman-whoring dog. Okay. So, guys, please get rid of these dogs when you see them. Don't wait for me to insult them, okay? Accusing Rebecca being three when Isaac married her. See, only someone filthy, a filthy dog like Tovia Singer, a filthy dog like Tovia Singer, would stoop to that level and insult our God in the scriptures to justify their false teachers. Muhammad and dead rabbis are burning in hell for rejecting Jesus, the true God, the God of Tovia, the God of the rabbis, the God of Muhammad, all who reject them under his feet in hell. Glory to Jesus. Now, coming back to this issue, focus with me. Focus with me, guys, because you know I'm going to have to do a part two. Dre Ezzi, I have an email responding to Tovia's representative. Michael Brown and I have agreed to debate Tovia Singer on three topics. Tell that coward to accept my challenge and Michael Brown. He won't debate me unless he debates Michael Brown, and then he can debate me on two topics so I can bury him with his rabbis. All glory to Jesus, the God of the rabbis. Now, let's come back here and focus. Okay. And I, yes, I have the emails. The coward, when he heard that Michael Brown was going to debate him too, ran with his tail between his legs because he's a filthy dog. He's worse than Muhammad. Yep, you are, Tovia. You are a dog. And I don't mean insult dogs. They're cleaner than you. Glory to the triumph God. Now, come back here. Let's focus. Six and a half years old. Six and a half years old. A nine-year-old. A nine-year-old comes up to me, folks, and tells me, a nine-year-old, Tells me Jesus Christ is the son of God. And he loved you so much that he came down from heaven and he died for you to save you. And you know what? Though I was born in a Christian home, my parents never told me the gospel. When I heard those words at the age of six and a half, folks, I was rocked. You know why? Even as a six and a half year old boy, um, I don't want to cry now. Because I cried too much and people are going to say, oh, he's faking it. No. When he told me there was someone that loved me this much, I was moved in my heart. I couldn't believe, <clears throat> couldn't believe that someone would love me so much to die for me. Now, he told me, go at night, go at night and say this prayer. Now, I thought I had to repeat this prayer word for word because I didn't know any better. I thought this is the prayer you have to pray. And I knew I was going to forget that prayer by the time night. Now notice, he told me at night. So I thought I got to pray at night. Little did I realize I could have just right there said, Lord, come into my life. I didn't know. You know, you're a kid. You take everything literally. So I'm, I'm reciting the prayer. I'm reciting the prayer. Night comes and I used to sleep in the same bedroom with my beloved mother. Okay. And I forgot the prayer. I forgot the prayer. So I wake up my mom telling her, mom, mom, please tell me how to accept Jesus in my life. And she went to sleep. She thought I was nuts. Now, this is what happened. Now, I said I wouldn't cry. I and mean, I'm not trying to cry to put on a show. God knows. Lord, purify my heart. I, I, I remember the gist of my words. I said, Jesus, I don't know how to pray to you. But, Lord, I want you to come into my life. Mm. Mm. Come into my life. Right. 
And that's when Jesus revealed himself to me. I was six and a half. And I'm about to be 48 years old. And I can tell you I can tell you, he's never disappointed me. He's never broken my heart. He's never forsaken me. He's never abandoned me. Though I have turned against him, I have denied him, I have blamed him, and I have accused him, and he just waited patiently. And he just waited patiently. So then when I got around the age of 20, I felt a, a strong in my heart. So by 1999, I went into full-time ministry. And I've been serving him ever since imperfectly. And what's amazing, I can testify, the more I walk with Jesus, the more he walks with me, the more I get to see how beautiful he is, how irresistible he is, <clears throat> how merciful and loving he truly is. And the more I fall in love with him, and the more I adore him, and the more I become inseparable for him, because I cannot live without him. I cannot live without him. I, I can't. I'm being honest. I'm not just saying it. You may think I'm saying it. I can't. I can't imagine a world without Jesus. Mm. I can't do it. Mm. I can't imagine a heaven without Jesus. I can't do it. That's why I said last time, Heaven is not simply a place. Heaven is not simply a place. Heaven is a person. Jesus is my, my heaven. Jesus is my heaven. Without Jesus, there is no heaven. So even if I enter heaven and it's a perfect place where there's no more pain, no more suffering, you know what's the first thing I'm going to say? <clears throat> first thing I'm going to say? Where's Jesus? Where's my Lord? Where is Jesus? Where's my Lord? It's not heaven without Jesus. It's not heaven without Jesus. <clears throat> okay, so let these stories encourage you. Okay, let these stories encourage you. Let these stories encourage you. Even the patriarchs, even the prophets who saw dreams and visions of God appearing to them visibly, who even saw God appear on earth visibly and saw miracles and were taught by the Spirit to give us the words of God and write them down, even they needed their theology to be perfected and corrected because they also needed to have a relationship with God and walk with God and talk to God. And the more they did, the more they knew who he was, the more they trusted him, and the more they loved him. Right? Is that sinking in? Sinking in, right? Now, could go back to the meaning of, oh, and let me tell you a story about this, this man, Raymond Malco. I wish, I, I'm going to invite someone. I promise you I'll do this. I'll tell him to call me on Skype and witness on Skype. All right? A witness on Skype. I'm going to have him call me. I have friends that remember me when I was six and a half years old. Raymond Malco and I, and he'd be the preacher. I used to be silent. Did you know that Raymond Malco at the age of nine would do street evangelism? We would walk, and I'll even give you the area. Andersonville in Chicago, Illinois. Andersonville in Chicago, Illinois. Around Clark Street and Foster. From Foster to Lawrence. All the way to Bryn Mawr, Clark Street. I'm giving you the area. He would start preaching at the age of nine, and I would just be next to him listening. Crowds would gather. We would lay hands on people and pray for their healing, and he'd preach the gospel. He preached the gospel. And his mother then, his grandmother, his grandmother would then take us in and teach us how to worship and pray. And here you're going to see where my attachment and love for the mother of my Lord came from. You want to know where my deep love for the mother of my Lord came from? My mother, the mother of Jesus, Mary, from his grandmother. His grandmother early on taught me to fall in love 
with the blessed mother of Jesus, my blessed mother, your mother, the blessed mother of our Lord, Mary. You know why? She taught me a song, but she taught it to me differently. And I'm going to sing it to you. And you want to get shocked, folks? He's got the recording. He's got the recording. She recorded it. At that time, you used to have audio cassette. He has it. You'll hear me as a young six and a half, seven year old and him nine year old praying this. He's got it with him. He told me he has it. Got it from his grandmother who went to be with the Lord. I got to get it from him. She taught us to pray. And this is one prayer that sunk in my heart. But I have yet to find this version of the Ave Maria. She taught me the Ave Maria. And you know how she taught it to me? I want to say it. Please don't laugh at me. I'm just trying to remember. This is how she taught it to me. Not the way you hear it. Because I have yet to hear this way of saying it. Ave, Ave, Ave Maria, Ave, Ave, Ave Maria. That's how she taught it to me. I still remember it. Right? So even at a young age, she put the love in my heart for my, the mother of my Lord, my mother. So she taught me to love her and adore her. Love her and adore her. Right? I saw him years later. He had grown up. Now he's no longer in ministry. He's no longer in ministry. He's married. He works a job. He takes care of his wife and three kids. When I had seen him after so many years had elapsed, we'd, we'd grown up. And this is what I'm talking about over 10 years ago. When he looked at me, you know what he said? Because I was in full-time ministry at this time. I was in full-time ministry. And he was following my ministry. He goes, I follow you. I read your articles and I get to see your shows. At that time, we were doing shows for ABN. He looked at me and he goes, Sam. He goes, man, look what he said. This is what he said. He goes, now I know what my calling was in life. You know what he told me, folks? He goes, now I know what my calling is and what was in life. My calling was to bring you to Christ so you could do what you're doing now. That's what basically he told me. I was put here to preach the gospel to you, Sam. The Lord used me to bring you to Christ so you could do what you're doing. All right. <clears throat> all right. So you see, it's all not just head knowledge. It's not just head knowledge. Read the scriptures. This is real history. This is true history, sacred history of people who actually lived and did the things the Bible says and learned from them. And learn from them. And so don't forget to pray for my brother, Raymond Malco. Raymond Malco, his wife and three children. That man is sharing in the blessing of my ministry because that man was my spiritual father who brought me to Christ. So this ministry is an extension of him bringing me to Christ. So pray for him. Okay. Now, let's go back to Genesis 17 to see. See why... Isaac is the only son of Abraham. Now, remember what Genesis 17, 18 said? Abraham said, oh, that Ishmael would live before your sight. Now, Genesis 17, 19 to 21. How much time has elapsed? Because, you know, I got to do a part two, right? Raymond, Raymond, Malco. Raymond, Malco. Okay. Genesis 17, 19 to 21. Yeah, let's read it. Can I give him again? Okay. Genesis 17, 19 to 21. Sorry, brother. He posted it. Let me go back and read. Why is Malco is M-A-L-K-O? K-O. M-A-L-K-O. Thank you, Chauvin Thomas. I appreciate that. I don't know if you're taking a cheap shot. Sorry. Genesis 17, 19 to 21. And God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed. And thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him. Now notice what he says about Ishmael. 
Notice what he says about Ishmael. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and we will mul and will multiply him exceedingly 12. But now 21, 21, which I didn't see. Princes and children, and we will multiply and sending 12 princes will he beget and will make him a great nation. Now, Genesis 17 21. Guys, here's why he's the only son. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. Did you guys now understand why Isaac? God bless you in the super chat, all of you guys. Why Isaac is the only son? Why Isaac is the only son? Lord Jesus, bless the connection, destroy the buffering. Please, Lord. So do you see why he's the only son? All right. He's the only son because God said, my covenant is with Isaac and your descendants will be numbered through him. Ishmael, I'll bless, make him a great nation. But Isaac is the son of the promises, the covenant. So if someone tells you, why is he the only son? Yes. He's the covenant child. So not that. with that said, we got all this background in play. How much time has elapsed? How long have I been doing this? Just give me a time frame because I don't want to go too long. I'm going to do a part two tomorrow, God willing. I'm going to do a part two because this should still have blessed you. 81 minutes? Okay. Now, let's see, show, show some parallels with Jesus. How does the story of Abraham and Isaac parallel Jesus? Let's go back to Genesis 22 too. Okay, Genesis 22, 2. I'm going to do a part two. All right. oh, they're getting angry over there, outside. Genesis 22, verse 2. Now notice who he is. He's the only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. So notice he's the only son, the one that Abraham loves. Only son, the one that Abraham loves. Okay, two things. Now, the word only in Hebrew, guys, follow with me, is yachid. Yachid. The Greek translation, the Greek translation is agapitas. Right? Agapitas. Let me double check. I don't want to go by memory. Again, because I don't want to be confused. Let's check it out. I don't know if Fritz Lance is here. I haven't heard from the brother. All right, hold on. Let's go to the English translation of the Greek to see if I'm correct. I may be wrong. I don't want to mislead you. I pray God will protect me. Yep, agapetas. It's it's on he agapesas. 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 Agapes. That's agapetas. All right. So it is that word. Agapeton. Agapeton. Ton agapeton. Yep, agapetas. Good. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for saving me from error. And help me to pronounce the Greek correctly for your glory. Okay. So in the Greek, it says, your son, your beloved, agapitas. Agapitas, right? Follow with me. Isaac, the agapitas of Abraham. The yachid of Abraham. The only son of Abraham whom he loves. Okay. Now, let's go to Hebrews eleven seventeen. Hebrews eleven seventeen. Yeah, exactly. It is Christos and Esti. Agapitas would come from agape, the one that you love and adore. Agape, agapitas. Yep, good connection. Okay, Hebrews eleven seventeen. 17, who is Isaac? By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Folks, the Greek word here is monogenes. 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 I want to see how the Greek would go. Monogenes. Monogenes. That's the that's how some Greek guy would say it. Monogenes. Monogenes. Okay. Do you see here in Hebrews eleven seventeen, Isaac is Abraham's monogenes. Monogenes. Do you guys see it? Monogenes. Do you see that Isaac here is said to be Abraham's monogenes? Monogenes. Monogenes. Right. Monogenes. Okay. Now. Let's see who Jesus is. John 1, 14. John 1, 14. Let's see who Jesus is. I may, may, not, need to, may not need to do part two. John 1, 14. Watch here. Who is Jesus to the Father? 
And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Same Greek word, monogenes. Now, I'm not giving you the exact form of the word. I'm giving you the root. Monogenes, monogenes. 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 So now notice, Jesus, watch here. Jesus, like Isaac, is his father's only begotten. Jesus, like Isaac, is his father's monogenes. 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 Yeah, the only generated one. Yeah, Azul, the only generated one, the only one born. Did you get it now? I know in Greek you don't pronounce the G, right? It's monogenes. 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 Kesikala ere monogenes. All right. Everyone with me, though, you get the point? Jesus, like Isaac, is his father's only begotten, right? Okay. Now, remember I said the Greek translation of Genesis 22 2 identifies Isaac as agapetas. Agapetas. Beloved. Let's go to Mark 1 11. Mark 1 11. Mark 1 11. Watch here. Mark 1 11. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Guess what the word beloved is? Agapetas. You, Jesus, are my son, my agapetas. So Jesus, like Isaac, is the monoenis, monoenis, monogenes of the Father, the beloved of the Father, the agapitas of the Father. Are you making the connection? Are you seeing how Isaac becomes a picture of Christ? Are you getting that? First connection. Isaac, like Jesus, is the only begotten, the only beloved son of his father. That's the first connection. Let's go to Genesis 22, verses 4 and 5. Second connection, Genesis 22, verses 4 and 5. Second connection. Watch here. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off, where he would offer Isaac. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass. And I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Okay, guys, watch me. Watch me and listen carefully. What day did Abraham Isaac arrive at the designated mountain in Moriah that Abraham would have to offer Isaac? What day was it? Read verse 4 again. What day did they make it there? Coincidence, Pedro? On the third day... Abraham's only begotten son, his beloved, would be offered and returned to his father on the third day. Given back to his father on the third day. Coincidence? You, it didn't sink in, huh? Who, 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 it didn't hit you guys? I know many of you already know this. You've already heard it. But here's what you don't see. You don't see verse 5 again. Verse 5 is what you don't see. In verse 5, you know what Abraham literally says? Let's look at verse 5. Literally, you know what he says? You stay here to the servants. My son and I will worship and we will come back. We will come back. Him and I will come back again to you. Now, I think the New King James captures the plural. Can you see the New King James? See if it says we will come back. So watch what we're going to do here. Watch here. Watch, guys. Watch. And Abraham said to the young, his young man, stay here with the donkey, the lad, and I will go yonder worship, and we will come back to you. My son and I, we will come back after we worship. But hold on, Abraham. You were told to kill your son as a burnt offering. Why are you saying... You and him will come back. We will come back. Yep. Do you know why, folks? Was Abraham lying? Folks, pay attention. Was Abraham lying when he said, we're going to come back? My son's going to come back with me? 
Was he lying? Good, you guys remember. You remember this stuff because it's got to be second nature. No, he wasn't lying. It's because he trusted God's promise. Now, let me show you how Abraham reasoned. You just read in Genesis 17. You just read in Genesis 17. God said to Abraham, Abraham, you're going to have a son, Isaac. He's going to be the, the heir of the covenant. And my blessings to you will be extended to him and through his seed. Okay, that's what God said. Now, now, now here, start imagining, visualizing, put yourself in situation. You're Abraham. God says to you, that woman, although she's old, will give you a son. Don't doubt it. He's the son that's going to be the heir of the covenant. And your descendants will be numbered through his seed, his descendants. All of a sudden, at the age of 100, and this woman is age of 90, Isaac is born. Miraculous proof of God's faithfulness. Miraculous proof that God keeps his promise. He cannot lie. Wow, God. I waited 25 years from the time Ishmael, Ishmael was conceived. And you finally did it. You gave me a son from the very woman. And you did it at an old age, which was humanly impossible to destroy any doubt I may have how powerful you are. If you can make a nine-year-old woman get pregnant by my seed at 100, nothing's impossible with you. And you can be trusted in everything you say you'll do. Right? But now here's the monkey wrench. Now, that's how he's reasoning. He saw it. God, here's Isaac, like you said. You truly are almighty God, El Shaddai. You truly are faithful and will never lie to me. And you've proven yourself faithful to me, though I failed you time and time again because you've given me that son. How can I ever doubt you? How can I ever lose hope in you? Okay, but now, here's where the confusion comes in. Get ready now. Isaac, Abraham, yes, Lord. That covenant son, yes, Lord, sacrifice him. What? Put yourself in his shoes. Don't just read it. These are actual historical events of actual people who have actual emotions. Genesis 22, 2. Offer your son, sacrifice him. What? But God, I waited all these years at an impossible age to have him as proof that he's the heir. He has no children. So then how are you going to keep my promise through him? He doesn't have a son. He's not married yet. God, what are you saying? Abraham, trust me. Sacrifice him. And now imagine the war inside him. Imagine the war inside of him. Right? How can you do this to me? Sacrifice the son you promised me. We waited years. I was 100. Sarai was 90. And you did the impossible. And you blew our mind how powerful and real you are and how faithful you are. And now you expect me to do this? But I've come to know you. Remember what I said? The more you walk with God, the more you learn about God, the more you end up trusting him and falling in love with him. This was another opportunity for God to teach Abraham, trust me, I'm going to teach you a little more about my character. Just trust me. Walk with me on the journey. And that's what he's telling every one of us. He's telling me, Sam, you haven't seen your daughter since June. Your very heart from me, the ones you put to sleep at night, woke up to, the ones that you wanted to protect that no other man would put their hands on them. And now you've lost them since June. And another man's filthy hands is hugging them and kissing them and watching them. Another filthy, wicked sinner who doesn't believe the Lord. And you know what's amazing? This guy, Martin, is an agnostic atheist. He doesn't even believe in faith. He mocks the faith. His name is Martin Simon Yaku. Pray against him that he repents and leaves my children alone. And so, you know, God is telling me, Sam, Sam, walk with me on this journey. Sam, trust me. Walk with me on this journey. Sam, a corrupt judge and corrupt lawyers of the devil tried to put you in jail 
for a $45,000 debt that you didn't accrue, but your ex-wife accrued because her lawyers were bloodthirsty and greedy and this judge hates men. And now they're trying to get you in Illinois to put you in jail to make you pay. And it seems impossible. Trust me. Walk with me on this journey. And watch my wonders if you just trust me and walk with me. See, it's not just a story. It's a true story to teach us how we should trust. So now, God, I've seen you since six and a half years old. You're faithless and your goodness to me. You never left me. You've never forsaken me. You're not about to give up on me now. I walk with you by faith on this journey. Take me where I must go to get closer to you and to be more in love with you and become more like Jesus. I will walk with you. Guide me by your Holy Spirit. See, that's what, that's what Abraham did. You know what he said to himself? You know what he said to himself? He's a good God. He's a faithful God. He's an almighty God. He has not disappointed me. He has not left me. He has not abandoned me. He's been with me and he's been my best friend. If he said, this man, Isaac, this son, he's the heir of the covenant. He cannot lie, but now I must sacrifice him. But I know he, he, he told me he's the one and he can't lie to me. You know what? I bet God wants to show me his power in resurrecting him. I bet God wants to show me a taste of the resurrection. I bet God wants me to sacrifice him so that he can raise him from the dead and show me his power over death. Because there's no way he's going to let him stay dead. There's no way. Impossible. He's a good God, a holy God. He cannot lie to me. That's his reason. Now let me show you where, where I got this from. Can I show you where I got this from? I didn't make it up. Not that smart. Pedro, you know where I got this from? Hebrews 11, 17 to 19. Let's finish it. Hebrews 11, 17 to 19. Yeah, I didn't get it from myself. Hebrews 11, 17, 19. Pedro, read with me. Here it is. God bless you too, basic. Watch here. Watch here. By faith, Abraham... When he was tested, offered up Isaac. By faith, didn't know why, but he trusted. There's got to be a reason. He's a good God. Who had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son. Promises about Isaac. Of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. Now notice 19. Guys, notice 19. Concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Do you see where I got this logic from? Hebrews, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, told us what Abraham was thinking because the Holy Spirit revealed it to him. The Holy Spirit told the author of Hebrews, Abraham reasoned in himself, God is going to raise my sin from the dead. You read it right there. Yeah, Pedro, are you seeing it before I move on? Are you seeing it? I didn't make this up. The Bible told you. Are you seeing it? Okay, you see what he's saying? He reasoned, God will raise my son dead. How can you be certain, Abraham? You don't know my God. I know my God. I've been walking with him. And he's proven himself more than faithful and more than almighty to me. There's no way he's going to disappoint me. No way he's going to lie to me. No way. It won't happen. He will raise him from the dead because he's not going to fail me. And then the author of Hebrews says, and he did raise him back from the dead in a figurative sense. You know what he means in a figurative sense? As far as Abraham was concerned, Isaac was as good as dead. So when God spared him, it was as if he received him back from the dead figuratively, right? Because he thought he's as good as dead. So when he sa saved him, wow, it's like he received him back from the dead. Now, guys, can I ask you a question? Genesis 22 verse 4. On what day did Abraham receive Isaac back from the dead, figuratively speaking? What day? Genesis 22, verse 4. What day? Luisa, I hope you're listening to this. 
Okay, Genesis 22, verse 4, Protestant. Oh, wait. What day? Post it for me, brother. You got it. Black Smurf, come on, man. Don't hurt me. Read Genesis 22, 4. And Protestant here. Then on the third day, wait, Abraham received Isaac back from the dead, figuratively speaking, on the third day, like God received his son Jesus back from the dead on the third day. Abraham's only begotten son, his only beloved son, the son whom he loves, was raised back to life, given to Abraham on the third day. God's only begotten son, his only beloved son, the son whom he loves, was raised back to life on the third day and received to God on the third day. Louisa, did you get it? Are you seeing the gospel here? Did everyone see the gospel here? Did you guys see the gospel F written down 1,500 years before Jesus was born? It's all about Jesus. Every bit of it is about Jesus. Right? Now let's make some more connections. Genesis 22, verse 6. We'll finish it. I'll do it this session. I won't need to do a second one. Probably, Mickey. That I'm not certain. I haven't been able to confirm. But it's still irrelevant, right? It may be. I haven't gotten conclusive proof yet. It may be there. Hopefully, I'll find it, God willing. Genesis 22, verse 6. Guys, watch this. Valiant, read this. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac. Isaac carried the wood upon which he'd be executed. Isaac carried the wood that he'd be executed on. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. John 19, 17. John 19, 17. Isaac carried his cross as Jesus carried his. John 19, 17. John 19, 17. There you go, John. And he, bearing his cross... Went to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. Isaac carried the wood that he'd be executed on, cross. Jesus carried his wood, his cross, upon which he was executed. Not now, guy. Hold on, buddy. Not now. Don't call me now yet. I'm not done yet. I don't know who you are, but wait. Oh, it's Muhammad Ahmed. Hey, I'm Muhammad, hold on. Before I school you, hold on. Let me finish this point. I'm going to school you. Just hold on. Okay? Can you be patient? One second. Okay, so you see Jesus carried his cross, right? Carried his cross. I'm going to call him right after this. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'll call him after this. But I want to finish this because I'm not going to stop. That was a satanic interjection. No, Satan. The Lord Jesus rebuke you and crush you under his feet and cover us by his blood and fill us with the spirit. You're not going to distract me now because we're about to get to the climax of the story. Amen? Not now. Okay, but pay attention. Pay attention. Carry the cross. But then Isaac wonders, Genesis 22, 7 to 8. Genesis 22, verses 7 to 8. Watch here. Notice what Isaac wonders. Genesis 22, verses 7 to 8. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Dad, I'm a little confused. We, don't, we have no lamb. We have no animal sacrifice. Notice Abraham's response. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Don't worry, my son. God will provide a lamb. Now, here's what's interesting. Genesis 22, 13. Genesis 22, 13. He didn't provide a lamb. He gave a ram. A ram is not the same as a lamb. A ram has horns. Genesis 22, 13. Watch here, though. Watch where I'm going with this. Here's where I need to really focus because we're going to hit, hit the climax of this. Then Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. 
So he sacrificed the ram that God provided in the place of his son. The ram died in the place of Isaac to spare Isaac. A ram, not a lamb. Where is the lamb, Abraham? John 1, 29. John 1, 29. Abraham, where is the lamb? John 1, 29. Where is God's lamb? Where is the lamb that God would provide, Abraham? The next day, John saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. My son, Isaac, you and I are a picture of him. He's coming, my son. My son, he's coming. The lamb of God is coming, Jesus of Nazareth. And he's going to take away our sins. See what Jesus is telling you now? Walk with me. Walk with me. Embark on his journey with me. Let us walk together. And you will see I'm altogether lovely. And you cannot help but fall in love with me. <clears throat> this is moving in my heart. And he's saying, my son, do you see it's all about me? Abraham is about me. Isaac is about me. Adam is about me. Eve is about me. The ram is about me. It's all about me. How can you not love me knowing how much I love you and I'm in love with you and how irresistible I truly am? That's Jesus of Nazareth. But let's go back to the ram again. Genesis 22, 13. We're almost done. Let's go back to the ram. Thank Jesus, Leah. Genesis 22, 13. Let me show you something interesting. God is taught substitution. I'm sorry. Abraham is taught substitutionary atonement. That someone can die in your place to spare you. See, God is teaching us that God will allow someone else to die in your place to spare you. God will allow someone else to die in your place to spare you. How do I know? Genesis 22, 13. Here you go. Then Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram. And offer it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Now notice what he's saying here. Isaac doesn't have to die. I will allow a substitute representing him to die in his place. Abraham, I will allow this ram to die in his place so he can be spared. Because I will allow someone else to bear your death, your punishment, your sin. Right? But I don't know if you caught the picture. The ram is a picture of Christ. Christ dies in our place. Like the ram died in the place of Isaac, right? Now, folks, I don't know if you know this. Some of you already know. It says that his horns were caught in a thicket. A thicket is a thorn bush. A thicket is a thorn bush. The ram was caught in a thorn bush like Jesus had a crown of thorns stuck on his head. The ram in a thorn bush, the son of God, a crown of thorns as a signal that ram that pointed to me, and I'm here. A thicket is a thorn bush. You see it? You caught it there? How it's all about Jesus? It's all about Jesus. Now, don't forget, though, the principle. God says you will die. Now, what, what is God teaching us here? Here's the principle I want you to take away with. God said to Isaac, to Abraham, Isaac must be a burnt offering. So what, what did God not do? Notice what God didn't do. This is what I want you to listen now. Notice what God did not do. He didn't say, okay, you passed the test, move on. No, no, no. I said Isaac must be offered as a burnt offering. But I do not delight in the death of Isaac. So... I'm not going to go back on my word. Here, pay attention to this. I said, offer him as a burnt offering. So I won't go back on my word. However, I'll allow someone else to take Isaac's place and die the death of Isaac in his place, and I'll accept it. So what is God trying to teach you? The soul that sins shall die. You sin, you shall die. And I can't go back on my word because I'm a just God. If I said it, it must happen. But here's good news. I'll allow... Someone worthy enough to die in your place so that I can spare you from death so that my word is still fulfilled. I didn't go back on my word. A death still took place. 
but not your death, someone representing you dying the death you deserve. And the only one worthy enough is my lamb, the son, Jesus Christ. Did it sink in? Did it sink in? But now, thank you, Pistol Pete. Is it sinking in, right? But now let me show you, Jesus is here. Do you know Jesus is here? You know Jesus shows up here? Jesus shows up here and he speaks from heaven. He speaks from heaven. Let me show you. Are you ready? You want me to show you where Jesus is? Let's read Genesis 22, 9 to 12. Genesis 22, 9 to 12. Jesus is here. Genesis 22, 9 to 12. Okay. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Now watch here. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven. So this is heaven, God's abode. The angel is calling from heaven, God's abode. Abraham! Who? The angel of the Lord. Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to harm him. For I now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Notice you fear God and you love me more than your son. That sounds like two persons. You didn't keep your son from me. You love me more than your son and you fear God. Father and son, father and son, right there. Thank you, Satu. God bless you. you. Got it? The angel of the Lord spoke. Now notice, folks, he's speaking from heaven. The last place that God needs a creature to speak from him is from heaven's throne. So why is the angel of the Lord speaking from heaven? The last place that God needs a creature to speak for him. Because that angel is no creature, that's God. But it's the angel of the Lord, that's Jesus Christ in his pre-human existence, looking to Abraham saying, Abraham, you fear God, and you didn't hold your son from me. You love me more than your son, and you feared God. What God? The Father. Who's me? The Son. Because you and your son are a picture of the Father and me. What the Father is going to do through me. But unlike you, Abraham, unlike you, I stopped you from going through with the sacrifice. I stopped you. No one will stop me from dying on the wood. I'm going to go all the way through it till the end. That's the difference, Abraham. What's the difference, Abraham? You were prevented from killing your son, but no one's going to stop me from dying. Unlike your son, who didn't have to die, I have to go all the way and actually die and break the heart of my father and the spirit. Abraham, Abraham, Jesus is calling him. Here I am. Don't harm the son. Now I know, Abraham. Now I know. I now seen your love for me displayed in your actions. You love me more than your son, and you fear my God, the Father. Even though at that time he wasn't his God. And so you know what Jesus is telling us? You know what he's saying to me? And I'm not saying I'm Abraham, God forbid. But let me show you how it applies to me. He says to me, Sam, now I know you didn't put your daughters ahead of me. Sam, you love me more than your children. And my answer is, how can I not love you more than them? I'm no Abraham, Lord. I am no holy servant. I shame you and I ask that you forgive me. But Lord, how can I love anyone as much as you or more than you? I can't love anyone the way I love you because you are my God. You are my Lord. You are my life and you are my friend. Right? And so the Lord looks at you guys and he says to you, 
Pedro, now I know you fear God because you did not love anything more than me and you did not withhold anything from me. Exactly, Mike A.D. Did you now see the gospel in Abraham and Isaac? Did you now see the gospel in Abraham and Isaac? And tell me, is it a coincidence? It's the angel of the Lord from heaven. He's not on earth. He's in heaven. Heaven. He's crying out from heaven's throne. The angel of the Lord. That's Jesus. Do you, what more proof do you want? What more proof do you want? Jesus was there overseeing this and designing this to be a picture of him and the Father. Now, let me put the icing on the cake. Let me put the icing on the cake. Okay. Can I put the icing on the cake? Okay. When Abraham was asked to offer up Isaac, notice what Abraham did not do. He did not offer something of inferior value to himself. He did not offer something less significant than him, less valuable than him, <clears throat> less precious than him. Abraham offered his son, who is equal to Abraham in essence, equal to Abraham in value, equal to Abraham in integrity, e equal in Abraham in honor. In other words, Abraham gave the best he could possibly give someone equal to him. That's what the father did with Jesus. The father didn't give something inferior to him, infinitely less than him. The father gave us someone equal to him in essence, equal to him in glory, equal to him in majesty, equal to him in value. It's the best he could possibly give the one who is equal to him like Isaac was equal to Abraham. Like Abraham didn't give something less than himself, God didn't give something less than himself because if Jesus is a creature, that means God gave us something infinitely less than himself. So in the story of Abraham and Isaac, you have a picture of two equal parties, two equal persons, two persons, father and son, equal in essence, nature. Come on in. Sorry. It's okay. They're preaching the gospel. Let people in. Okay. Okay. Now listen to what I'm saying. Sorry, God buffered. Okay. Now follow with what I'm saying here. Just like, just like, Abraham and Isaac were equal in essence, nature, glory, and value. Two equal parties, two equal persons. A picture of father and son. Two equal parties, two equal persons. Same essence, same nature, same value. Otherwise, you're gonna have to say. God gave us less than the best of himself. Someone infinitely inferior and less than himself. Whereas Abraham gave the best of himself, someone equal to him, so that Abraham outdid God in his willingness to sacrifice to God the very best. Do you catch it? So if you're not a Trinitarian, if you're not a Trinitarian, I'm going to end it with this. If you're not a Trinitarian... You're, you have to say and argue and believe that God gave something infinitely less than himself, infinitely inferior to himself, a mere creature. Which means Abraham outdid God in his willingness to give God the best of himself, someone equal to him, not less than him. Only the Trinity makes sense of what God did. Are you with me there? Only the Trinity makes sense. Of what God did. The father did not give someone infinitely less than himself. He gave the very best of himself. The person who is his heart equal to him in essence, nature, glory, and honor. Only the Trinity shows that the father outdid Abraham in what he gave up for the world. The father outdid Abraham in giving up his son who is infinite in majesty and glory and power and worship and honor. Only the Father outdid Abraham in the Trinitarian understanding of who the Son is. Right?
Okay, so I hope it blessed you. I hope your Resurrection Sunday was blessed. Do pray that I'm not too loud and distract my neighbors so they don't get upset with me because I have neighbors. But pray that God will use even my preaching to convict them. Pray God will put me on a course of getting healthier and holier. Pray the Lord blesses the apartment, blesses my brother, Sal. Provide for us. Pray for my daughters. Jesus fights for them and brings them sooner than later and provides for them and keeps them healthy and away from anyone. Right? And pray God will help me to grow in holiness and, and righteousness and purity and wisdom and knowledge for the glory of Jesus because we can't love him enough. Lord willing, Jesus willing, I'll do another session tomorrow. Lord willing, Jesus willing, look for me between 6 and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 6 and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So look for me there. It's it's too late for the Mohammedan. Uh, he don't worry. He's on my YouTube. I mean my Skype. I know you're excited for me to barbecue people for the last, but give me a break, buddy. How many debates you want me to have? How many barbecue sessions? It's easy for for you to say, right? I'm doing it. You're sitting there just smiling with popcorn. Do pray for my daughters. Covenant with me and fast with me for my daughters that the Lord will bring them. Keep anyone away from them that's not of the Lord and provide for them and me and keep me in love with him and Give me the holiness and the health I need to glorify him. Remember, the father gave you the best of himself. He gave you his heart, his son, one who's equal to him in glory, majesty, honor, and value. And in doing that, he outdid Abraham. He outdid Abraham. He goes, Abraham, you know what he said to Abraham? He said, I'll meet you one and give you another. I want to meet you. Not only will I give the, the world my son, like you're willing to give your son to me, but my son is of infinite value, equal to me, and there's nothing that can compare to the dignity and glory and honor of my son, the very best of me, my son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father. We love you. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We love you. Christ, you are risen. You are alive, and you can never die. Keep us in love with you and save us from the evil one and save my daughters for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Take care, guys. Unbelievable. I would watch a hotel that.